Geothermal power. It's a real thing. And today, we're gonna make it in a video game. So welcome back, my fellow duplicates, to Oxygen Not Included. Today, we're going to be turning a couple of volcanoes into batteries to power our base. Today, we're going to take a look at the enclosed cycle system here. Now, in the last couple of videos, we've actually explored things for refined metal volcanoes here so that we can take that energy, get it out, and then actually cool that metal down enough to where we can drop it into our base and make use of that for whatever we want to do with that. That also sparked a whole lot of investment investigation with all of this stuff, which is going to be applicable in this video as well, which, uh, yes, let's, to say the least, we received many comments. Uh, I think we tr trigger, triggered the inner scientist in, in most people. There was 150 comments on the last video. Um, and this is all starting from this original video down here, which was automating the steam turbine so that it actually runs in its most efficient form as per video game science and all of this stuff. So don't get me wrong, there's a lot of video game science that goes into everything we're talking about here. This does apply a little bit in, in concept, but not so much in numbers and all that stuff. So don't... Now, when I look back at the comments over the last couple of videos here, uh, there's, there's two main ideas of how we can manage a volcano. One, we can directly put the steam on the volcano and then try to cool it down to an efficient level so that the turbine will run. The other method here runs a lot like what I've done right down here, where I'm using a thermal coupler between the magma and the turbine here so that I have the steam that's going to be used up top and then the, you know, the basically the mass down here, the heating mass down here that's going to be running through this coupler. So that when the doors are closed like this, the heat transfer is going to happen when they're open. There's no heat transfer happening. My expectation is that the one over here on the left is going to be the one that we're probably going to end up using. But before we get there, let's go ahead and take a look at the one on the right because it's far more educational. Um, inside of here is a mass of steam, a lot of steam, right? And the thing is, when we start to, when this volcano starts to erupt and eject a ton of material, what we want to do is add mass into this area in order to basically attenuate the temperature changes. So we want to bring that 1,700 degrees down to 195. The reason we want to bring it down to 195 is because once we go above 195, uh, this thing will be um, overproducing. So it'll just get hot. The steam turbine will just simply get hot um, and it won't be producing more power. So naturally, I started to look at the numbers here. So using the oxygen not included assistant here, I got some sort of idea of the uh, total amount of mass that I was going to be dealing with, and it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, it's anywhere from, on one of these 99 tiles to like 80 tiles worth of igneous rock magma. <laughs> and figuring out just how much we had to remove, how much water we had to put into the system. The thing is, it doesn't necessarily happen all at the same time. So it's kind of hard to calculate, plus the fact that we have water entering the system as it's being cooled. Um, but nevertheless, I threw it on a spreadsheet here, and we're going to need to process nearly 570,000 kilograms of water <laughs> in order to cool that sucker down. Um, so what we want to do here is offset the enormous amount of water that we have uh, or that we would need in order to cool that down because we're not necessarily going to know what temperature the water is. Maybe we're bringing in sources of polluted water or whatever. Um, we want to basically increase the thermal mass over here, just like we saw in this experiment last time, which there were, there were a lot of comments about. <laughs> um, we want to increase the thermal mass so that as we add energy to the system, the total highest number is not super high. And as we reduce that energy, we want it to reduce at a slow rate so that we get the most energy out of it, which is the opposite, the absolute opposite of what we were doing over here because we wanted the steam to get as hot as possible, as fast as possible, so we wanted to keep the thermal energy out of it. So the difference that we were seeing here was based on the thermal capacity and the difference in temperatures. There's a, there's a whole lot more to it, but, and then there's video game science going on up here. Don't, don't worry about all that. Essentially, we were using low capacity material such as gold in order to create a greater temperature difference in order to increase the temperature of the steam faster. What we want to do this time is the exact opposite. So, what do we have that is a high specific heat capacity and a 
high thermal conductivity. Well, pretty much all of this has a high thermal conductivity, and that's probably not the most important thing that we're dealing with here. We want to deal with the specific E capacity. Diamond has the specific E capacity of 0.156. And if we take a look at a thermal shift plate, it has a mass of 800 kilograms, which is when you compare it to a tile, which only has the mass of 100 kilograms. Therefore, this will create a very large buffer of energy that we can use to kind of stop it from getting super hot and also slow the rate that it's going to cool. It's just going to absorb a ton of that power. So if we had a chart that was looking like this, right? The temperature was going to go really high and then drop down slowly or whatever as we remove the energy. By increasing that mass, we're just going to make that curve a lot more gentle. Now we do have a better material available to us, which is thermium, because that is specific heat capacity of 0.622, but that's kind of space age stuff, so we're not gonna worry about that. Steel is a very close second in that it has a specific E capacity of 0.49. But you also have to look at the melting temperature here. That's 2000, so that'll be fine in our volcano. Um, the diamond is as over 3000, so that'll also be fine. One thing that may be a problem is if we were to use gold, in this case, it has a melting point of 1000 degrees Celsius, which is why it melted last time um, when we subjected it to the full volcano power. Okay, so now that we've talked for a ridiculous amount of time, let's go ahead and just take a look at what I have set up over here. All right, so let me show you what I have going on here. I have a steam turbine up top with several wheeze warts to keep that thing cool. Down here, I have some steam. You can see that I have a fair amount there. And I also have some automation set up as well. So if this goes above 198, then it'll turn on. If we go below 10 kilograms, it'll turn on. And then I have a hydro sensor down here to make sure that I don't flood out the volcano. So what we should see here is that when this volcano goes to erupt, we're going to try to water it down as fast as possible in order to keep that temperature down. I'm also running three doors over here with the middle door set to open. It closes and then opens, and that creates a vacuum between the two areas so that the heat cannot transfer across. So just like I have right here. See how this is closed and that has a door in the middle. If we go to auto or whatever, you can see that the heat is going to try to transfer. So if you keep that open, it's real simple. You can just put it on a signal switch or a timer. There, there's a lot of ways to set that up. And just to keep the temperature from switching around as much as possible here, what I'm going to do is put in a ton of diamond thermal shift plates here. So that's 25 thermal shift plates or basically 20 tons of diamond. <laughs> Times that by 1,000. Ooh, 2 million grams times 0.516 okay 10 million dtus per degree so i don't know what that you can use that if you care all right here we go oh it's not false alarm another cycle and a half Ugh. all right so here we go the very first time this volcano is going to erupt let's see what happens <laughs> well it got hot quick we're immediately over 300 degrees Celsius. Temperature shift plates are, are up to 700. The steam is at 700. Pump more water, more water. One thing that I'm seeing here that's actually pretty good is that the igneous rock is, is actually just becoming, you know, solids like this. So it's not, you don't have to dig anything here, but, oh no, the liquid. <laughs> Needless to say, the heat production of the steam turbine currently is inefficient. A uh, better way of putting it is, wow, things are getting really hot. Matter of fact, it's now too hot. And the volcano is still erupting. Oh, no. Oh, and now we've got the big problem is because we haven't cooled it fast enough, it has solidified and entombed itself. So, now could we continue to scale this up till it actually matches the volcano so that it doesn't instantly overheat and cause all sorts of problems? Yeah, we could, but I think there's a much better way to handle an enormous amount of energy like this, and that is by separating the two chambers. All right, so let's take a look at the second arrangement over here. So what I have here is six tiles worth of water down there. So that's six 
thousand kilograms of water which is a fair bit more we can actually continue to add a lot of water to this which can help um, make sure to get this uh, magma cooled very very quickly we want to get it solidified quickly so that it doesn't end up in a entombing itself and the trick to that is cooling it down very very quickly from its liquid to a solid state so we need to be able to at least absorb that amount of energy so I do have diamond shift plates back here, but I don't have quite as many over here as I had before. So I just have four, four, and then two right behind the volcano. All right, so there we go. The volcano is erupting. We can see that <laughs> it spit out a ton of material. Um, look at that. 591 kilograms, nine tons, another 900. Oh my gosh, so quite a bit. But it's still very, very hot. So we're waiting for the heat to transfer. Now, unfortunately, my temperature overlay um, really doesn't show a lot because it's so hot here. But all right, so this is taking forever to heat up. So I think what we need to look at here is what am I using for the medium down here? Because unfortunately, when we end up with an igneous rock down there, like this guy just takes forever to transfer its heat because it's first off, it's sitting on neutronium, which I can't get rid of. And it only wants to transfer into the steam, which is now in that one tile, even though I have all these shift plates behind it. So I need to increase that rate of transfer. So rather than use water down here, let's see what happens if we try to use something a little bit different, like phosphorus. So phosphorus turns into a gas at um, 280 degrees Celsius. But beneath that, it's going to be a liquid and a solid. So it's a solid at 44 degrees, but it's a liquid state in between that and 280, which means we should be able to get a good amount of mass right down there on that igneous uh, rock and be able to transfer a lot of energy into the thermal shift plates, which ends up in the window tiles and whatnot. Now you can find this all over your base. I mean, it's like way over here, check it out. Buns of it, tons and tons of it. So we can just take some of this, just drop it in there. Bloop. You can even use an ore dropper these days in order to get it down there. There we go. Uh, 1,200 kilograms. Now this will flash into a liquid and then into a gas. And we should see that temperature try to transfer a little bit faster. All right, so there we go. We should heat up this phosphorite. And there we go, phosphorus gas. Man, did that heat transfer fast. Look at how hot that got right off the bat. Boom. We're nearing the maximum temperature for the steam turbine. And you can see that we've now separated the two areas. The thing is, we still have a bunch of magma down here. And we have a whole bunch of phosphorus gas up top. But the real thing is that the magma is in contact with the temperature shift plate here, which isn't really what we wanted. So let me, let me try that again. All right, so I'm going to try the exact same thing, but this time I'm using a lot more phosphorite. So there we go. Boom, it's melting. And yes, this time we are cooling that magma fast enough so that it ends up into igneous rock right off the bat. Perfect. And we can see that the temperature here is doing exactly what we want. It's well over a thousand degrees Celsius and it's transferring very 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 quickly up here to the top um, perfect so that's exactly what we wanted to see right there i just needed a little bit more um, phosphorus so yeah i'm using 4.4 tons of phosphorus all right so you can see that we're currently just running two doors right there which means i'm running 450 watts out of the turbine up top and it's currently bouncing back and forth between <laughs> you know, to, to save its temperature a little bit. So, you know, to be real, you could, you could easily just do this number, right? We don't need all of this. We could just set this to be, if it's above 195, then we close those doors and bring in more energy. You don't really have to automate the ports. You could just automate the temperature of the steam down here. So here's what I did. All I did is set this to 195. So every time we go below that, these doors are going to close. And that's running this turbine up here pretty darn close to 800. 
So watch what happens when it gets down there. That'll close. Temperature spikes right back up. And we run right back up to about 850 watts. So it just goes between 850 and about six, 600 something down there. It might even be a better idea just to move that thermal sensor up away from the plate just a little bit. All right, so I'm letting this thing run yeah, nice and quick here. Uh, you can see that the temperature down here is starting to go down. We're at down to 800 degrees down below it. So we're just, we're constantly pulling a little bit more energy out of that volcano, out of all the phosphors down there, the diamond shift plates, everything. And we're pulling it through the mechanized airlocks uh, into this chamber up top to suck more and more power out of it. So it's pretty much been, you know, I mean, if we take a look at the reports here, well, I'm probably going to have a couple of steam turbines. Well, maybe not. You know, 422 kilojoules, 440, 488, 400, cycle after cycle. And that's what you should be expecting out of the, one of these units. You know, if it does 800 watts, you should be getting right around 480 kilojoules a cycle. Okay, so here's a cool thing that's happening. Um, the temperature that comes out of the steam turbine here is at 95 degrees Celsius. But since we are running this with all of the doors open down here, we're running a, a large amount of water through it, or a larger amount than what we would be running if we were running two or one doors right there. So that means our capacity to cool this steam turbine, self-cool it, is higher than it would be otherwise. So the temperature that this is now finding its way out at is going to be, mm, it should be self-cooling is what I'm trying to get at here. Maybe. Okay, it's not quite self-cooling. However, I don't need all of these wheeze warts here. I should be just fine with what I have over here on the right. Hooked up to this little thermal sensor that just activates if it goes above 96. So you can see it's running up to 99, 99, and then those doors close. The wheeze warts turn on for just a second and the temperature starts to drop back down. I'm right here, I'm locking this door if it detects phosphorus gas. I don't really know if that's it's not a good idea. But it was kind of fun. You might be able to do something with a phosphorus gas, maybe. Maybe one of those duplicate waiting stations, uh, I'm not sure. So the question is, is the temperature going to get low enough to condense the phosphorus gas back into a liquid before this thing goes to erupt again. Well, let's speed it up and find out. Okay, so the answer is no. This is still 600 degrees Celsius. I think we're going to have to wait until this thing goes dormant for a good long time before it's ever going to get cold enough to go in there and actually remove that igneous rock. What, did it not erupt? What's going on here? So it's 583 down there, but I can't really get this above 172 now. I think my best option it, to increase its performance once the temperature gets lower is to make everything, make the distance shorter. So I'm gonna rework this just a little bit to make everything more compact. Humble currently has two great new bundles that might interest you. We got Lego Games Bundle and Python from O'Reilly. So whether you're looking to learn some stuff or to maybe play some new stuff, they might have the right package for you. I've actually been thinking about playing Lego Worlds back when it was first releasing, but I never got into it. Now, I think I might make that jump. If you use the link in the description below, not only will this go to help support this channel, because you can see I'm partnered with Humble Bundle, but it'll also go to support these great charities, created the content, and Humble themselves. Thank you guys so much for your support, and have a wonderful day. All right, so after messing around with this a little bit here, this is what we've come up with. Uh, very, very small little arrangement here. Uh, the first thing to kind of keep in mind is that you want the phosphorite to be spread out down here when you first start this thing up. That way, it flashes over to a gas and then condenses this down into igneous rock quickly. If it if you get the lava to build up there, you're going to have an issue. It'll actually uh, solidify enough to go in there and dig it out because it'll entomb the volcano. Not the end of the world, but it's definitely not something you really want to have released into your base for too long. Um, luckily, you can get through here because the doors are available. Uh, these are actually important. Um, you can see that one door is closed, then this one is open. Um, so all you do is you set this one up here in the middle here. Set it up, you can set up to any automation signal. So if you wanted to do temperature and then just flip it between above and below, all you do is once you go through here, there's gonna be a little bit of gas and then you can uh, close it, delete the gas, open it up, and now you have a vacuum chamber between the two areas. So a bunch of the heat doesn't keep going across there. Uh, down here we have all the igneous rocks. So this is hot, hot, hot stuff. 
that's going to be transferred via the gas and the shift plates behind it. Uh, this vertical piece of, you know, conductive tile, be it iron, tungsten, steel, or diamond, is is uh, actually it helps to have it right here. Uh, the reason that it's good to have this right here is because the liquid is going to touch it right there, and uh, when all of this is just a liquid, once it gets down to the lower temperature stuff, that's when you that's when you want to make use of it. Uh, the the insulation that I'm using here is ceramic tiles. Once you have two tiles right next to each other, you can see the temperature really doesn't ever transfer out beyond the second tile. So that's really useful. Up here, obviously, you only have steel doors, so that's what you're going to want to use. That's hooked up to an automation sen sensor, and in this case, I'm using 192. What you want to do is try to keep the top temperature here, uh, the high swing of this, to be less than 200 degrees, or right around there, pretty close to that because otherwise this is going to produce a little bit too much heat up top. Um, so you might want to actually take this and drop it down to 190 or something like that. It really comes down to how much water you have up here. So you can add more water to this uh, by just adding an external source right there. And that way you can run closer to the right temperature. So the more mass you have up here, uh, the less it's going to do this number as it's transferring across because uh, this example here, there's just not as much thermal mass up there because there isn't, you know, a ton of tiles. So I might even set this to be 185 in this example here. You can play around with that a little bit because you probably won't have the exact amount that you, that's just perfect. So 187 might be the right number right there. But as far as the liquid is concerned, I have an insulated pipe right here at the joint and then I have radiant going right back over here like that. This is moving two kilograms of water constantly and it gets up to 98.8 degrees Celsius before it exits this right there. I have a gold shift plate in this exact spot right there. You don't want to put it too far over, otherwise it's like right there on the wheeze wart. Put it right there. Um, and then use the thermal sensor right there to go below 97 degrees Celsius. So when you do that, that will keep this thing running just, just below 100 degrees Celsius, which is pretty crazy. Now, I haven't tested this over hundreds and hundreds of cycles. I don't really have that kind of time. But I can tell you this right now, that it seems like one uh, steam turbine will match up with one volcano. And it, that seems to work out just fine. There's going to be a period where things are very, very active. And then in this case, where it's in its dormant state. So it's going to be here for a while. All right, so I was letting this thing run while I was editing the video in the background, and I noticed that it had stalled out, and it had stalled out at 500 degrees down here in the phosphorus. So once it got below that, it would just, uh, the output of the steam turbine was cooling it enough, and I don't know what exactly why it was happening, but it just wouldn't generate any power. It was like 20-something uh, kilojoules per cycle. You can see that, 27. Um... So what I did is rather than pipe that output right back into here, I put it into a reservoir. And that reservoir is hooked up to two things. So we've got the uh, this thermal sensor. So if this is above 500 degrees, then we open it up. And uh, since we could pull a vacuum over here in this, I added this sensor here. So if it's below 5,000 um, grams right there, then we will also turn the shutoff We'll open that up and let the liquid back in. So you can see this, I'm able to drive that temperature down very, very low now. So now we've gone from a gas to a liquid and this thing continues to operate perfectly. So we get nice, we get, you know, a lot of power here. We still get a lot of power even though the temperature down here is quite low. So it's kind of a hybrid system now. Fancy, I know this thing looks simple, but when you really get into it and you really get into it, there's a lot going on here. But there we have it, now I think I got the perfect solution. I was, a little, I was a little disappointed that the reservoir sticks off the side like this, but see how I made it look like a battery. It's pretty cool. At any rate, there you have it, guys. Hopefully, you guys have enjoyed this little episode here of Oxygen and Not Included and the whole little series here on volcanoes. I might do some different geysers here in the future, and you guys have been talking about sour gas a whole lot of time, so I might cover that as well. If I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that, and as always, stay awesome, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Peace. Brotgar out.